Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi sammyao sanputoshe. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi sammyao sanputoshe. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa. 百千万劫难遭遇，我今见闻得受持，愿皆如来真实意。Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hong Shi. We're going to be investigating the Flower Garland Sutra. Shri Fu Shangren, Goe Shri Xiong Naja, Amitofo. Delighted to be with you today. It is in Australia, Sunday, September 13th, on a rainy Sunday afternoon. In California, it's Saturday, September 12th, around the world.、Uh, thank you for joining. We've got a fascinating piece of Buddhist magic,、uh, which is not magic. That is to say, something uncaused or something that the senses find hard to to explain. Science has no explanation, but、uh, the Buddha has, in a very scientific way, taken us step by step in using his.、Uh, Paradigm, his his、um, exemplar, his tenth stage bodhisattva, to show the the path, to show the technique and the steps required to、uh, to approach Buddhahood. I'm going to need to be allowed to share again. Can you, please? Can I share the screen again? The T. There we go. Well, hey, we're back. Okay, are we back? Are you? Yeah, there we go. So I touched my touchpad. Don't touch your touchpad. Something I just learned.、Uh, smarter. My computer is clearly smarter than I am. So, okay.
we're back. And what I was saying was that the Buddha has shown us the path to Buddhahood, um, taken us to the 10th stage Bodhisattva stage, the stage of the 10th stage Bodhisattva, and he may or may not go ahead to Buddhahood, but he's right at that crossroads. And this is a how, this is an instruction manual. So let's, today is a very interesting step in that whole process. We're gonna come back to page 50 in a, no, 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 take it back. We're gonna come back to page 48 when, uh, after we do our invocations. So here's our text for our invocation. we do this we are going to chant the Chinese what we're doing is we're invoking presence we're saying namo I return to the sutra of the Buddha's flower garland it's great expansive teachings and the ocean vast assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who brought this text to us that's what we're about okay we chanted in Chinese seven times with that melody please join Namuda instrument was is British back made in a time when there was a great tradition of British classical banjo the Clifford Essex model and uh, lovingly transported from Europe by Jody Stecker and uh, came to my hands not long ago and what a blessing here's our text for today and Let me, uh, so the last, where we left it last week, it was disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva on the stage of the Dharma cloud can display limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis of nayutas of sovereign spiritual powers like these. We just went through three weeks of psychic powers or more, was it? And psychic powers showed what this Bodhisattva is able to do with his mind or her mind at this point of his refinement and development. All done with that part, all about Shantong, which is a much disputed, much uh, pondered on and obsessed over aspect of mm, Buddhism. Of, and it's also human development um, that uh, has been in Asia for years. And, and yet when it comes to the West, because of our kind of evidence-based approach to knowledge, our scientific uh, criteria where everything, the only thing that can exist has to, only things that can be measured exist. Uh, 
we don't allow anything like, for example, consciousness. How do you measure consciousness? Doesn't do any good to deny it, but since we can't measure it, it stays on the periphery of science. And so that's, it becomes a fascinating, I mean, if you were interested in going into the cutting edge of the place where science meets traditional wisdom, studies of consciousness would be the place to go. Um, so, psychic powers is an aspect of that, and we just found out what the Bodhisattva can do. So, having s finished with that section, some, there's a conversation that is now going to take place here in our Dharma, our, our flower garland assembly. So, I won't try to introduce it anymore. I'll just let you all experience what the Bodhisattvas are talking about. Who's the conversation between? It's between uh, the audience and the speaker. The speaker is Vajra Treasury, Treasury of Vajra Bodhisattva, Chingang Zang Pusa. And he is uh, about to uh, do something marvelous. Ready? Er shi hui zhong zhu pusa qi tian long ye cha qian ta po er xiu luo hu shi si wang shi ti huan yin fan tian jing ju mo xi xiu luo zhu tian zi deng xian zuo shi nian ruo pusa shen tong zhi li neng ru shi zhe How'd you like my accent? That's, that's a very representative. At that time, all the bodhisattvas within the assembly, along with the gods, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, the four world protecting kings, chakra, devanam, indra, the god Brahma, the pure dwelling gods, Maheshvara, and all the other gods and others, had the following thought together. If bodhisattvas can have such powers of wisdom and spiritual abilities, what about the Buddha? Right? So, who a doubt, a doubt arises in the mind, having heard the incredible account. Not incredible is not the right word, very credible, but amazing and kind of inconceivable, awesome list of the things that a bodhisattva can do. He's not a Buddha yet. He's a 10th stage bodhisattva on the Dharma cloud stage. Knowing what he can do, like what's left for the Buddha? What's the difference? Okay? So, that's the question. I love this because right within a sacred text, right within this holy scripture, what do we get? We get a very human response. And the doubt is right there. That's so neat that uh, this, this uh, critical approach, this critical thinking approach is reflected in the text itself. And pay attention to that, how important that is. It's not the case that because we feel like we believe in, we, we like the Buddha's spirit or his approach or his kindness, so therefore we have to absolutely accept everything we hear at face value. Uh-uh, not the case. This wholesome, critical attitude uh, skepticism, Skept not skepticism as an ism, it's not a, like a, I'm adopting skepticism as my platform, no, it's when you hear something or you see something that raises doubts in your mind, address it. Analysis. Um, I think that's really, really healthy. Okay, I've got ahead of myself, I've, if anybody is clocking my, my talk from the point of view of Dharma lecture, sutra lecture protocol, I just deviated from it, which is what? Read the text, deal with the language, then go into meaning. I, I skipped right into meaning, which I shouldn't do. What did the text say? At that time, all the bodhisattvas in the assembly, everybody gathered around the Buddha. Um, 
sitting in full lotus, flying through the sky like devas, right? Every, all the bodhisattvas, first it mentions them, but then it goes through all the spiritual beings who are here in the assembly listening in. This is the whole audience. It's as if the camera just turned. You know how we have uh, America's Got Talent or Australia's Got Talent, and they're always flashing to the faces of the audience, and then the panel, when they hit the red button, you know, they, they get to see who's there. Well, the camera's looking at the audience here. Who's there? Gods, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras. Who are they? Well, yakshas are called speedy ghosts, su jigwe. Yakshas are, if they're in the world without the Buddha, they are scary. They are flesh devouring ghosts. Yakshas are the most horrific nightmare beings that uh, the world of video games could come up with, right? Kind of, or uh, Transformers movies where these horrible, nasty, awful, you know, teeth protruding and eyes bugging out and uh, those kind of baddies and villains and nasties. That's a yaksha. I'm not slandering yakshas. That's, they are very scary. Um, human artists, uh, traditional artists, have tried to draw yakshas um, when they are in the hells helping out King Yama mete out punishment. You can find yakshas there, but they're not only in the hills, they're through all these realms, in the ghost realm. These are ghosts. And when the Buddha's in the world, they are very ruly, not unruly. They lose their fierceness because why? They have met someone who they cannot harm. The Buddha is inedible. You can't eat him. He's beyond dying. He's, uh, he's already, you know, his body has turned to Bajra. He's got a Jin Gang Bu Hai Shen. Furthermore, his mind, he's got a Jin Gang Bu Hai Shen. He's got a Bajra indestructible mind. He can't be scared by Yakshas. So what do the Yakshas do? They relax around him. They know the limits of their mortality because they're ghosts. They're, they're mostly Yin. They're not very much Yang at all. And they have a lot of limits to their, they're driven by appetite, driven by emotion. And they too have a Buddha nature that seeks liberation. So in the Buddha's Dharma assembly, here are the ghosts, just, just with their palms together, looking up at the Buddha, thinking, can I be like you? How, how do I do that? How do, how do I become like you? You know. So the Buddha subdues the gods, the dragons, the yakshas. Who are the Gandharvas? Mm. Chentapo. The Gandharvas are a fascinating, fascinating uh, species of category of spiritual kings. They're music spirits. And Gandharvas are, along with Kinaras, both. Those two uh, categories are um, they live to serve through music and they they are in how do we how do I know about these things do I know I am quoting what I have learned I have not seen these spiritual beings with my eyes so I can't uh, I won't try to you know I, I need to own up right so uh, that this is I'm passing on what I have learned by my study of the Dharma so this is knowledge available to anybody who listens to uh, a learned teacher like Master Shrinha for example or reads scholars accounts of sutra translations etc so when you read in the Avatamsaka Sutra you find out about Gandharvas who um, are at the call of, for example, Chakra, who is also mentioned in our paragraph here. Chakra is called chief among gods. He is a, uh, he's the, the, the chief deva in the second level of heavens in the six 
desire realm heavens. So heaven number two in the desire realm, which is the realm that we live in, when you go up to that level, it's on the summit of Mount Sumeru, they say. There is chakra. Chakra wants to entertain for some reason. It's party time. And apparently the parties in the heavens are pretty sublime. He lights a certain kind of incense and the, the fumes of the incense travel to where the Gandharvas are and no matter how far away they are, they will show up with their Clifford Essex banjos in hand to play music for chakra, right? They also use their music as an offering to the Buddha. So Gandharvas are like that, they're musical spirits and they, um, they're also a wild spirit. I mean, they are powerful kings in the spiritual realm on their own right. They also have this quality. I've, I've heard stories of depictions of Gandharvas and uh, the women are supposed to be extremely beautiful and the men are supposed to be extremely scary. So Gandharvas, you don't mess with Gandharvas, right? Then we get to whom Ashuras, another category, species of beings in the, what are called the Eightfold Pantheon. Asuras are titans. Asuras appear in the Grecian pantheon of gods. If you read uh, about the, you know, you read your, your stories of uh, the gods of Mount Olympus, right? You find out about, about titans. And titans are huge physically very, very large beings who live to fight. So do Asuras. Now, anybody who's working on your master's thesis or looks for a project for your term paper in Buddhist philosophy or, you know, comparative religion, here's one for you. Compare Asuras and Titans. Um, some people will tell you Asura is, is no H, Asura, okay? So Asura, Asura, both. I, I learned it with the H. So the S, the Sanskrit S will have an accent or not, depending on how you pronounce it. So Asuras in the Buddhist pantheon, they also appear in Hinduism, but they are strongly present as titans in the Grecian pantheon, right, of the Grecian gods. So... My goodness, uh, here you have stories of the Titans competing with the gods on Mount Olympus. Zeus, right, Jupiter. They're fighting with the Asuras for control of Mount Olympus. Okay, mm. Edith Hamilton is the, the collector of these myths and translators out of Greek that, that uh, the way Houston Smith's book on the world's religions became the standard text for generations of students of comparative religion. Likewise, Edith Hamilton's translations of the Greek myths of Greece, the Hellenistic myths, uh, was the standard text where you find out about Titans. So Titans are there competing with the gods for power on Mount Olympus, shift over a couple, what, thousand miles where Hellenistic world meets the Indian, Indic world and you discover that in Buddhist mythology, is that the word you want to use, the old stories, here we have Asuras trying hard to knock Chakra out of Mount Sumeru so they can have the, the blessings and the authority of the gods. Shurfu, Master Shuenhua would always say, Asuras have a nature that loves to fight. They only live to contest. And they have, the, they have the, the blessings of the gods, but not the authority. So Asuras are powerful warrior figures. And they say again that the males are very hard to look at, but the women are very beautiful. And they appear from time to time invading the, the heaven of the 33 devas, the Triastremsha heaven. And according to the Abhatamsaka Sutra, there's a drum. There's the deva's drum, the drum of the heavens, the Tiangu. 
And what does the Tian Gu do? The, the Deva drum is there as a klaxon. It's there as a warning belt, as a warning drum. When it sounds out, boom, 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 the Devas know, oh my goodness, the Asuras are attacking an invasion by the Titans. So what do they do? They all turn out with their weapons to fight for the Devas, fight for possession of Mount Sumeru. So the Avatamsaka Sutra talks about warfare in the heavens. Who would think you die and go to heaven and you still have to fight? You get drafted to be a Deva soldier. So the, uh, it's called the, uh, the Shen Shopin, the worthy leader chapter, the chief of the worthies chapter of the Avatamsaka Sutra. We could explain that at some point. That might be another text to look into. Um, the Shen Shopin, the worthy leader chapter, describes how the Titans, the Asuras, come charging into Mount Olympus, into Mount Sumeru. And Chakra, who's coming up next, he's in the same paragraph here. Chakra, what does he do? Chakra is very ready for the uh, attack by the Asuras. And Chakra, he fights with what? Psychic powers, these very abilities. He has a certain amount of Shantong as chief of the second level of heavens. And what does he do? He uses psychic powers to change his appearance. And he goes from being a very adorned, beautiful deva-like god, you know, better than any Hollywood movie star, more adorned, more attractive. From that appearance, he shifts into his warrior mode. And his warrior mode, his eyes shoot lightning like that, and his teeth shut out of his jaw. And he's got multiple heads and multiple eyes and multiple hands. And every hand, he's got, now he's got like 20 hands. And the hands each are holding this uh, weapon, this deva weapon. It's a pestle. And a pestle is for grinding and smashing. And the pestle is electric and it shoots out flames. And so his breath comes out and his eyes bug out, lightning and flames and this pestle. And every single invading Asura, because of the power of Chakra's psychic abilities, every Asura warrior who's attacking sees this multiple bodied, multiple hand, multiple head and eye warrior coming to him alone. All of them, like a platoon of Chakras in their warrior mode, and his warrior mode is coming at that single Asura. And the Asuras go, ah, uh, ain't going to mess with that. And they turn around and flee. And the, the Deva drum stops beating and the Devas go off to celebrate yet another victory. So that's the story. And who says so? Avatamsaka Sutra describes, describes this combat in the heavens with psychic power. Who says this text is just Buddhist philosophy, boring, right? Uh-uh, they haven't read it. They, don't, they never opened it. So, so that's the assurance. And as, uh, as our teacher described it, one of the fascinating things about assurance is they don't inhabit a geography. Humans, our human experience is here on planet Earth, although recently in the Bay Area, it seems less inviting, less familiar as a human dwelling place. It seems more like post-apocalyptic hell realm with red skies and darkness at noon, right? Arthur Kessler wrote Darkness at Noon. Well, you can see it this week in the Bay Area with the, the smoke from the fires drifting down and cutting off the sunlight. The uh, particulate matter, air quality inside houses in the Bay Area was very unhealthy children are being told not to come out of their rooms in, among friends who are writing to me about what it's like in the Bay Area these days. Anyway, so we still have to inhabit this human realm. We can't choose where we live, right? We have to breathe air. We can't live in the water. We can't live in the fire. We have to live on the earth with the air up, air above, heaven above and the earth below. That's where we live. Asuras 
on the other hand, live in many different realms. Master Hua would say, uh, if you look at fish, people know about uh, Piranha fish, Piranha fish that live down in like the Amazon River in Latin South America. Piranha fish are these small fish, but they have so many teeth they can't close their mouths. And if you throw something edible into the water, a, f a herd of piranha will appear, school the piranha, and turn it into bones in a matter of seconds, right? Those are the asuras among the fish. I suppose if you had North American mammals, the asura would be the wolverine. Ah, dear old Michigan. I spent years in Michigan going to school, and the wolverine is the, the animal of Michigan. That's our state animal. Wolverines are so nasty tempered that they live pretty much alone and they will, if, if you get on the bad side of a wolverine, they will track you, they will follow you and they're almost indestructible. Bears and wolves run away. There are still, there are not many wolverines left. Humans have done a job of, of wiping them out, but they're still alive in the Upper Peninsula, the UP. Michigan not only has the mitten, right, like that, in that shape, but up above, there's this section that connects with Wisconsin and Canada north, and that's the Upper Peninsula, UP, and there are wolverines still alive in the UP. So, possibly, we could say that the wolverines are the assurers of the North American mammals, right? Uh, they say, Master Hua would say, in the human realm, Asuras are both the robbers and the cops, right? You can have good Asuras, people who thrive on contention, on fighting, and on the contest. So that would be the police who are determined to subdue the baddies, right? The crooks, the criminals, the bandits who are the negative, the yin assurers, fighting for power, stealing stuff, knocking others down. Um, he would say, Master Hua would say that if you look to the realm of sports, the best competitors on the football pitch, the cricket pitch, right? The rugby pitch, they might be assurers among humans, faster, stronger, meaner, right? Um, what occurs to me is when I, whenever I heard Sherfu explain Ashuras this way, I remember uh, hearing about the tank battles in World War II in North Africa between the Germans and the British, right? It was Montgomery was the, the British tank commander and Rommel was the German tank commander. And the panzer tanks would square off across the sand dunes with the British, uh, what was the name of the British tanks? Enfield, I forget. And they, they would go at each other, both of them interestingly belonging to the, the uh, astrological sign of Scorpio, fighting in the desert for power. Ashuras, right? So the great generals may well be wholesome Ashuras. So Ashuras is this fascinating Dharma realm, the, the uh, Shulo Fajia, right? The Dharma realm of Ashuras. It's fascinating because the Greeks are Hellenistic. They say the cradle of Western civilization, perhaps, arguably, also recognizes Titans and travel the other side of the globe. And here you have the Indic civilization saying, yes, Ashuras. They really exist. So if we look at it from the perspective of Chan, from Yi Chie Wei Xin Zao, from everything that's made from the mind alone, then what that might suggest is that I can produce Ashura-like behavior from my own mind, and I want to be careful not to do that, especially not now, where uh, the whole world seems to be ready to explode. Uh, we're stressed in so many directions. We are afflicted on so many aspects with a pandemic which does not seem 
to want to go away. It keeps changing and changing. And for which a uh, vaccine may not be ready for months and months. Uh, so that's a stress. There are uh, hurricanes happening in the south. There are fires burning up most of the three million acres in California and now in Oregon. The headlines in the New York Times last, last couple of days was 500,000 residents of Oregon were told to pick up and run for your life, were told to evacuate. Half a million Oregonians were told to evacuate. Where are they going to go? Right. So, my goodness, we're stressed on all sides with economic crisis, right? What if you can't feed your kids? What do you do? Where does the food come from? That's stress on parents. Children hungry, hungry children. Parents want to provide for their kids, right? So that's a stress. So this is a time when all that stress could easily explode. We could take out that frustration on those who are less strong than we, our pets, kick the dog, right? Our employees, shout at them, right? Just somebody who looks different than you, somebody who doesn't understand your language, whose language you don't understand. You can retaliate, vent this stress, and then what happens? You feel worse. It didn't help. It made you now feel bad, as well as being unable to hold on. So what is the necessary dharma? Patience. Understanding that native populations, native original peoples, the first peoples in America say, yeah, after the fire, fires cleanse, there will be renewal. We just have to make it through. We just have to get through it. That on the other side of it, with the practice of patience, there's a blue sky, there's temperate weather, there's a sense of belonging and enough to go around, right? We just have to be really patient. So when I see the Ashura thoughts rise in my mind, when that comes out of my nature, which it, I, my nature holds the seeds of Ashura-ness, I go, hmm, I want to be a positive Ashura and fight injustice to benefit others. If I have any strength, let me use it to make others' lives better. Right? Not just to knock him down. We have Ashuras in Australia. They are called lorikeets. <laughs> this morning, I put out the bird seed and put out the, the lorikeet porridge and pigeons came. We have wild pigeons. They're called white-headed pigeons. There were 10, maybe 11. I couldn't count them all. Wild pigeons that are very large and very, actually kind of nice looking birds. They're, they're not the, you know, the sewer rats that you people associate with big city gray pigeons. These are dignified, very mellow uh, pigeons who are, their family relationships are very clearly identified. There's a father, there are children, there are elders. You can see them, they're just all there. And they came down for their turn. Now we have a couple, a pair of lorikeets who uh, live close by, they're our, nat our resident lorikeets, and they've been eating since seven o'clock, since my, the food went out, and now it's 9.30 and the pigeons have shown. What do the lorikeets do? Their job, they take it, is to act like Asuras and chase every other bird away to prevent them from eating anything. They, doesn't matter if they go over here, the lorikeets chase them. So I was watching this morning, the lorikeet play tag with a big, with one of the adult male pigeons. Uh, the pigeon would land, the lorikeet would attack, the pigeon would fly up and land over there, the lorikeet would attack, the pigeon would fly up. They went in a circle, three rounds around a circle, landing in four places. So, and I just, watching this, I finally went out, I intervened, and I scolded the lorikeet and said, you've already eaten, calm down, learn how to share. And he went, chirp, looks so cute in there. Yeah. Meanwhile, the pigeon flew away, you know. My goodness, Ashura behavior is very much a part of these beautiful, 
rainbow-colored birds that everybody loves, except their behavior is just full of aggression. Good grief. Don't, I tell them every day, don't be a bully. Nobody likes a bully. So, Yakshas, Gandharvas, Asuras, four world-protecting kings, Si Da Tian Wang. They are another one of the Buddha's assembly. They show up when the Buddha is time for the Buddha to speak Dharma. Um, one of the things the Avatamsaka Sutra contains is cosmology. Cosmology is how the world is made, worldview. A worldview is how it's made. We have a worldview. Um, my Instagram feed is full of photographs of the Milky Way. I, I post pictures of wildlife to Instagram and I follow other photographers and I haven't done it yet. We're, we're, I live in a forest, so for us here to get a clear picture of the sky, we'd have to get in a car and drive. And um, there are, we're, we're in, on a hillside and there are the hilltop, I can see there are houses on, on two sides that probably have a wonderful, wonderful view of the heavens at night. But I share in others the photos that others post. I haven't tried it yet. Although my Olympus camera is set up for uh, taking time-lapse photos, so I need to, to uh, try it out one of these days. Anyway, people post photos of the Milky Way and starlit night. We're in the south, so the southern hemisphere would be a, fa a fabulous place to take pictures. But I look at these, this is the, the worldview, right? Oh, there's, you know, Polaris. Polaris, the pole star. Uh, what is it? Da Dao. Is it, uh, what's the pole star in Chinese? Bei Bei Dao. Bei Dao Xing. He's currently in Sagittarius. There's a precession of the equinoxes, so it's now in Sagittarius. And that's the world, the worldview, right? From an astronomical point of view. You look up. There you see it, there it is. So, in that worldview, as the Buddha describes it in the sutra, there, is, there are levels of heaven above our planet Earth. The first level is where the four world protecting kings, the north, south, east, and west, where those four kings live, and they the sutra describes them very, in, in great detail. Their names, their jobs, their abilities, their limits, their interactions, they come down and talk. They come down and deal with humans in the sutra. And not only in the sutra, in the Hindu classics, in the Brahmanist classics, there are lots of stories of these devas and how they, their habits, their, the names of their wives, their, their uh, lifespans, etc. So, yeah, and when it's a, the, uh, if it's a female Devi, you know, her husband. So, there they are, four world protecting kings. Then, our sutra says, Chakra Devanam Indra. There he is. Chakra Indra. Um, names that are known in the Hindu Brahmanist pantheon. What is so fascinating about Chakra is that he comes down and works with Buddhists who are on the path and cultivating. In a minute, later on, hang in there, because we're going to break out the banjo and... tune coming up later um, that talks about an encounter with chiefs of gods, Chakra and Brahma, uh, written by uh, a disciple of the Buddha who realized arhatship, the last one, the Buddha's last awakened disciple, Sunita. 
So, Chakra, one of the fascinating things about Chakra is that he, there encounter stories of his encounters with cultivators. And what do you do with that? You know, um, Christians talk about talking to God all the time. But when God talks back, that's where it gets really interesting. God answers. Um, And he will, the uh, chakra will come down and give you a test if you're really sincere. And you can pass the test and go on to more cultivation. Or you don't pass the test and you come back, try again, right, later. So chakra has another, there's another story that shows in the Xian Shou, the worthy leader chapter, the chief worthy chapter. Um, it's about the Deva Drum, the Tiangu we mentioned just before. The Deva Drum, the Tiangu, has two functions. One, like I said, is to warn when the, the Asuras are attacking. Another function is to let you know, if you're in the heavens, that it's Dharma talk time. It's Dharma lecture time. Here's a chance to hear some stories and principles that'll help you get free from birth and death. Whenever Chakra wants to speak Dharma, the David drum, boom, boom, boom. And it's got a different rhythm probably. So the devas hear it and they all go into the shan jian tang, shan jian dian, shan jian dian, the hall of wholesome viewpoints, the hall of good views, which is the Dharma hall. And the devas all listen in. Does it look like this when they come? Maybe. Is this the shan jian dian? Maybe. Look, look at the Shanjian on this side. Look out the window here. The beautiful gardens here in Queensland. Maybe the light doesn't let you see it, but very beautiful. We have our own Shanjian Dian. So the devas all show up, and Chakra speaks Dharma. He's a Dharma speaker. That's one of his jobs, as well as being a Dharma warrior, right? Chasing the Asuras away, using psychic powers. How fascinating that the sutra gives you a detailed behind the scenes look, pulls the curtain aside and lets you know what the deva's life is like from the Buddha's point of view. So, Chakra, Devanam, Indra. Then the god Brahma. Brahma, huh, probably should be plural. The Brahma gods, and not just one. Now, Brahma is, could be the god of Brahmanism. Boloman. Um, I tend to think because we went from the first stage of the heavens to the second stage, chakra, and then Brahma. Brahma is a god, gods in the form realm. Buddhist cosmology says desire realm, form realm, formless realm three realms before we get to the realm of arhats who have gone out of mortality, out of birth and death, okay? Buddhism talks very clearly in detail about how the world is built. I think that's so cool. It's like, yeah, we, we hear about heaven in the, from the Hebrews, in the Bible, descriptions of heaven, but it's not so clear, right? It's not so detailed. The Buddhist description says, yeah, here's the map. You want to see the map? Here. Go here, and then here, and then here. And if you go there, you go there. And how to get there. And how, what happens when you have to leave there. Because you let your blessings run out. Oh my goodness. Right? That's so... What? What's, what's the word? How, does it, how do you hear that stuff? It's fascinating to me because it's why... It's empowering. The Buddha not only describes it, but he says, you want to you go there? You can. Here's how. And then, and then, this is the fun part, he says, but don't. <laughs> don't. Nah. Because why? 
at the desire realm, it's still mortal. It's still mortal. You still have to come back. You still fall out of the heavens if you don't cultivate. So chakra in the, the hall of wholesome views after the dharma drum sounds, it's fagu, right? It's a tiengu, it's a fagu. What does he do? He gets all the devas into the hall and he says, uh, it's good here, nice, comfortable, everybody happy, good, keep moving, keep her moving. The Manitowoc Minute, he says, keep going, don't stop, because this is not ultimate. Comfortable, yes, better than being a human, even, but humans suffer enough to know to cultivate. Devas, you forget to cultivate because it feels so pleasant here. Keep going, don't stop. There's more to go. That's what he does. He urges them to continue to cultivate, to not forget their Bodhi resolve. He says, if you just stop for comfort, he says, you've totally forgotten your relatives who are back in California looking at a red sky at noon. Right? Remember to cultivate. Keep going for the sake of others. Don't forget your Bodhi resolve, says Chakra. The Brahma gods have already gone beyond the desire realm. They are born into the form realm. And the thing about the form realm is what? You are beyond desire at this point, right? Mara, the demon king, can no longer tempt you into losing your energy outflowing in the Brahma realm, what's it like? It's like samadhi. You're in dhyana samadhi all the time. Chanding. Chanding wei shi fa shi chong man. You take the food of dhyana as you take uh, dhyana samadhi as your food and you're filled with the joy of dharma. Oh boy, that's a goal of meditation, right? Once you taste that in your meditation, nothing else will satisfy you. You want to keep, keep going. So that's the Brahma gods. Furthermore, look what's next. Pure dwelling gods. What are pure dwelling gods? They say in the Buddhist description of the heavens that there are 28 levels of form realm heavens. There are 28 heavens in the form realm, the Brahma heaven. So Brahma, realm, form, realm. Same, same two names, same place. 28 levels. Among those 28, there are, what? There are five in particular that are called Qing, Chu, Tian. They are the heavens, levels of heavens of pure dwelling. They're also called Wu Bu Huan Tian, the five levels of heaven that you don't return from. Heavens of no further return, right? What are those? This, boy, this, this turned into a whole primer on the, the heavens. I didn't plan this to talk about in this detail. The heavens of Wu Huan Tian, the heavens that you don't come back from, where, who's there? Those are arhats who are in the process towards full arhatship. They're either first, second, or third, or fourth stage arhats who have more rebirths to go. Seven, one, no further or full arhatship when they're no longer in the Brahma realm. But if you are in process as an arhat, you can be a sound hearer, a voice hearer, a shravaka, right? You can be a Pracheka Buddha, uh, better ch I don't know, maybe Jin Chuan, Jin Wei, Jin Hosher, Jin Fosher. Can Pracheka Buddhas, do they stay in the heavens of no further return? I don't know. Do we want to ask Punyadamo, our Dharma brother, who is the expert in this? Can Pracheka Buddhas stay in the Wu Huan Tian, or are they somewhere else? I don't know the answer. I I think they realize nirvana in terms of the Buddhist tradition. Pracheka Buddhas realize nirvana. 
and then they what? it's like an arhat they have the same realization as an arhat okay so i'm going to challenge you again though because why arhat arhatship i i've learned and i'm i want to point to our dharma brother punyadamo who's up in uh, ontario way way out in the wilderness has written the wonderful book on Buddhist cosmology from the Theravada point of view, but it it's, works with the, the Mahayana point of view. He's the expert, but, and up on our side, we have our Dharma master, Jin Yong, who has done some extensive research. Maybe Jin Yong sure can type in if he's listening in. Um, there are multiple levels of nirvana. So Jin Chuan sure, I'm gonna ask, you know, further. There's nirvana with residue. So a shravaka, it has a nirvana. And at this point, nirvana is another samadhi until you get to full arhatship. And then, then you go on to the Buddha's nirvana as well, you know, anuttara, samyak, sambodhi. So you say Pracheka Buddha is in nirvana. Is yeah. it yo yu nyepan? Is it a nirvana with remainder still? And usually in the Theravada tradition, there's two types of nirvana. There's okay. nirvana with remainder meaning you realize the state of no outflows with, while well, you still have a body, you still your five skandhas, okay. but you no longer attach to it and you're, you're completely free of suffering. And then nirvana without remainder is when you actually, your physical body goes away and you, and you basically, you could say die in our perspective, but actually they, they no longer have to be reborn. That's nirvana without remainder. So when the Theravada tradition there's only two nirvanas, in our tradition, it's actually very interesting. We have four nirvanas. Right. We have this inherent nature nirvana, I think. And we okay. also have this uzu niepan, the nirvana without any dwelling place. Right. And that's what the Buddhas realize. And they don't dwell in samsara or nirvana. So they break the duality of samsara and nirvana and can go, you know, for them being in samsara is not different than being in nirvana. So that's why they're another level above the, the arhat and the Pracheka Buddhas. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you for that. Now, my question again, where do Pracheka Buddhas stay? Do they stay in the five heavens of no further return or somewhere else? The heavens of the no return is, is the, the, for instance, the arhat, the, like the third state ar, arhat, the, uh, the non-returner arhat, that's where they go. The, an, an, I think it's the anagamin, the non-returner. Anagamin, right. Yeah, and so they go there, but the arhat, fourth stage arhat they actually enter nirvana they they're out of the heavens from so the, from our tradition we still see them as somewhere but the but the theravada they say they don't it's, it's you can't even answer that question they don't go to a place right right so that's good and that we're filling in the gaps here but what about pracheka buddhas is my question they're the same as the as the arhat they but they realize the same as yeah, okay. same as arhats they realize the same nirvana from the theravada tradition the arhat the Pracheka Buddha and the Buddha realize the same nirvana. They don't have oh. that unk, the, the nirvana which, which dwells nowhere. They right. don't have that kind of nirvana. Nirvana. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good. Okay. So we're here. We are to summarize that. Here we have pure dwelling gods, pure abode, gods of the pure abode. Another translation of the same. They are in the five heavens located in the form realm with the Brahma gods. But they, I don't know, I, I, I would be fascinated. I should enter, get my Chan Samadhi together to find out if you're on, if you're just below the five heavens of no further return, is there a door? Is there a gate? Is that, sorry, our hots only. Let me see your name tag. Are you <laughs> qualified? And what if you go to, you know, six above the five have do you do you leave how i wonder how it works is it are the five heavens of no further return placed among the 28 levels in the form realm are they is there a wall you know how does that work i'd be fascinated to know the sutra doesn't doesn't talk about that but here we have those they're gods but they're arhats they're arhats living among the gods so you know, do you have multiple identities? Are you a Arhat Brahma God? I, I don't know the answer, but they all alike, regardless, come to listen to the Avatamsaka Sutra. 
because all without exception admire and look up to a 10th stage bodhisattva who, uh, whose heart, whose mind has expanded to the utmost point of expansion to where it's just the same as empty space except it's not. The 10th stage bodhisattva says, I could become a Buddha, I would prefer to stay with living beings. I have work to do. Once I'm a Buddha, I have to, I'm in another category. I'm gonna keep a little bit of my ignorance here, my connection with living beings, my identity with the ordinary living being in samsara so I can help them out. That's the place that these devas admire. And the, the, the uh, demons and spiritual baddies of the Eightfold Pantheon as well, right? On one hand, they love the Buddha's power and his fearlessness. On the other hand, they are moved and touched by his kindness. So, pure dwelling gods. Maheshvara and all the others. Who is Maheshvara? This is when we get into the Buddha's cosmology, oh my goodness, it's so like, these are great stories, these ageless stories that have been part of our human heritage all these millennia, and they're preserved in the Buddha's sutras, right? So what is this sacred storytelling? It's, and it's sacred storytelling that Physicists pick up and go, man, look at this. This just pushes our whole, our whole concept of quantum theory is just all embedded in this. And yet, here we are hearing about, you know, fighting for power at Mount Sumeru. And we hear about deep, great compassion. And people who strive to make the most of their opportunity in a human body. You know, so all of this, these aspects of sacred storytelling show up in these sutras. Looking at it as lit crit, right? Literature, liter lit literary critique, literary criticism. We just marvel at these as epic literature. These stories, right? Of human striving and human failing and human inspiration. And you can totally, totally make a theory out of Buddhist sutras as epic literature. All these aspects, layer upon layer, that you keep going in and in, and it doesn't end, right? Stories of psychic power. Oh my goodness, right? So, Maheshvara. Who is Maheshvara? He, it, there's two levels. If you leave the desire realm, and you're just about to get to to leave Mara's ability to delude you and to seduce you and to falling back, right? You know the Buddha's story where he's right there under the, the Bodhi tree about to wake up and Mara sends his daughters to seduce him, doesn't work. Sends his armies to frighten him, doesn't work. Mara himself comes to the Buddha and says, who says you're enlightened? I don't think you're enlightened. And who says you've put it all down, right? The Buddha in the legend touches the earth and says, the earth is my witness, nature itself. And there's a boom, 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 earthquake. Mara goes, curses, foiled again, har, har, har. Right? If you look at the uh, little Buddha, Bertolucci's film, that's really, that's really portrayed beautifully. Keanu Reeves gets to play the prince. Oh my goodness, and Mara, you know. Mm, I won't make any political comments here. He doesn't look like a Republican. No, he doesn't. No, he looks like a, a frustrated wannabe, somebody who wants to own the world, and he is foiled by the Buddha's goodness. Yeah, that's really, if you interpret our current presidential campaign in terms of good and evil, fits. Right? One candidate is saying, no, just be good. Be a, be a human. Be kind. Yeah. The other one, forget all that. I'll give you power. 
really fits. Here's the prince under the Bodhi tree and Mara. Who says? Who says? Mara is into fake news, right? The demon king is into fake news and says, I don't believe you're enlightened. Nobody I, I know says you are. And the Buddha says, well, touch the earth. Well, and the earth goes. Wah, 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 wah. Yep. Yep. Nature. Because why? And that's not, you know, am, are we anthropomorphizing the earth? Not a bit. There's power in goodness. When our nature and you could say the Tao, the way things are before we think about it, when the Tao and the earth, nature, align with goodness, there is a feeling. You can feel it. We talk about sacred space, you know, good vibes. The Beach Boys, I'm picking up good vibrations, right? Yeah, it's real. So the idea that the earth shakes when, when the Buddha asks for verification that, uh, who, that he's awake, yeah, maybe it's just a natural response, right? It's shan gunda, it's wholesome merit and virtue. So Maheshvara, Maheshvara, we keep talking about him and then going off on a tangent. So Maheshvara, Ishvara and Maha Ishvara, Maheshvara, live in the juncture, there's a heaven realm between Mara's realm, who tries to keep us all under his control, and the Brahma gods. In that juncture lives these two gods, Ishvara and Maheshvara. And they say that they have three eyes, they're depicted with three eyes, they ride a white bull, a Brahma bull is what Maheshvara rides on. And they are very zuzai, they are very free and comfortable, as Master Hua would say. And they are at the, they're the gatekeepers to the Brahma realm. They too are Dharma protectors of the Buddha. All the other gods and others, all together. The gods, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, world protecting king, shakra, devanam, indra, brahma, pro, pure dwelling gods, maheshvara, and all the bodhisattvas together say, wait a minute, if bodhisattvas have powers like this and such psychic powers, what about the Buddha? What's left for the Buddha? What is different between the Buddha and these bodhisattvas, right? So, okay, now we did it. We finished our textual line by line, aspect by aspect analysis of the sutra. So I'm gonna jump right back into the question that I asked, the, the, what I posed, which was how cool that Buddhist sutras encourage critical thinking. Question from YouTube, don't understand the question, let's see here, could it be Arhats and Pratyeka Buddhas are called such because the approach of their attainment is different. Um, not only the approach, but the result is different. Here's the way to see it. Use the Chan methodology. What is Chan methodology? It says, look at your own mind first and bring it home. Come back to your own lived experience. And what is our own lived experience is that sometimes my mind has more light and less darkness. Other times, emotions just cover it over and I'm in the dark. When I get myself get angry, let myself move out into thinking happiness is in that thing over there, or that person, or that relationship, or that attainment, or that fame, or rep Anytime I look out for things, the darkness grows, right? When I can look in and say, what was my, what would I really want? What was my motive for doing that, right? Then you say, oh, arhats have more darkness, ignorance, wuming, avijja, right? Pratyeka Buddhas have less. Compare, so that not just, not just an approach. No, it's a real accomplishment. A Pratyeka Buddha has removed more ignorance and transformed it. 
He's vacuumed more dust from under the bed. He's cleaned more closets. He has weeded more gardens than the Arhat. It's a real difference. Both have ended birth and death. So, Chan approach. If you ask a senior high school math quiz, how much math, how many formulas are you familiar with? How much theoretical math are you capable of factoring on a blackboard? And then you go ask a postdoc math major, right? God is doctorate in theoretical math. How many, how many, uh, how deep can you factor this equation? You know, how, how much, how, how many formulas can you, right, can you factor in? You know those incredible recent movies talking about the African-American uh, uh, engineers, I forget, they, they were the, th the mathematicians who sent, who were behind the first successful space shots, right? What's, what's the name of the film? Somebody wanna type in that name, put it in the chat box. There's wonderful, two wonderful films recently about what do they call calculating women? Was that what it was called? Uh, where the, the the movie focused on three particularly African American women, real women, real stories. Uh, the actresses who played them were just superb. This is before computers, when there needed to be uh, rapid calculations to get the spacecraft with a human being in it safely into orbit, they ask these mathematicians who happen to be African-American women. Hidden Figures, there we go. Hidden Figures was the name of the, the movie. <coughs> Incredible true story. And these women use their brains, use their ability. What's the difference between the high school senior who is pretty good at calculus, right? Trigonometry, right, can do all those things with numbers compared to the women of hidden figures, these heroes of the culture. Uh, they're both mathematicians. They're both working with the same materials. In the, quest the, the question from online was, could it be the Arhats and Pracheka Buddhas are called that because their approach to attainment is different? You could say, if, if an Arhat is only wanting to wake up and get liberated, well, that's wonderful, you know. You don't want to suffer anymore. Uh, I remember Dr. Konza standing at the lecture platform at Wheeler Hall in Berkeley and saying, yes, yes, of course you know, Shakyamuni Buddha was merely an arhat, you know, merely an arhat, ha, 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 he said. It's like, Dr. Konza, relax, you know, you are not, you can't diminish the accomplishment of Shakyamuni Buddha despite your erudition, so. Um, Maybe, maybe Buddha, uh, Arhats and Pracheka Buddhas, because they lack the Bodhi resolve of a Bodhisattva, can be considered lesser? Well, yeah. I mean, why do you cultivate? Why do you meditate? It's one of the first things I ask any meditation class that meets is, what, uh, why, did you, why did you meditate? What's, what's your motive? In the Tibetan tradition, they always start out any Dharma event by saying, let's establish our motivation. What is, what is your, what, what, what do you seek? You know, set that down. What is your intent? Clarify the intent and you can measure your progress and you will find the appropriate Dharma gate. So, if bodhisattvas have powers of wisdom and spiritual abilities like these, what about the Buddha? What about the Buddha? Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm going to talk you through a song here. We went through the uh, Eightfold Pantheon, and we mentioned Chakra, Devanam, Indra, and Brahma. <coughs> they show up in a poem written by the Buddha's last enlightened disciple, Sunita, an arhat, indeed, liberated, 
realized Bodhi of a sort. He was fascinating because he was an outcast. He was the fourth caste. He was a, a Harijan, uh, one loved by the gods, right? He was a child of God, known as a scavenger in the appropriate politically correct language. Uh, their job was mostly picking up picking up excrement from houses because there wasn't plumbing, right? Their job was to carry the, the excrement to, the, to where it was dumped. And of course, miserable job because it, it's not clean. There's the smell and all. So you had to wash constantly. As... Sunita was that. The suit, he wrote his own poem describing his enlightenment. I was born poor. In a lowly family, father disappeared, there was little to eat. My work was degrading, I gathered withered flowers from the shrines, I sold what I could, threw the rest away. So Sunita was already poor, he was an outcast, he was Chandala, and his father is didn't know his father, his father ran away. He starved a lot. Mom had a hard time feeding the children. What did he do to support himself? He would go to the pujas, to the shrines all over India, and take after the shrine, after the puja was over, he would take what was left on the altar, clean it up, throw away the garbage, take what he could and resell it, right? A beggar and a garbage man. People found me disgusting. And they despised me, they just ignored me, or they looked away. The pain of rejection hurt as much as the hunger, but I lowered my heart and I bowed every day. So he describes the plight of the homeless. Look at this. How many times get off at the at the uh, Civic Center BART station in San Francisco, the Fremont Street BART, and here's people lined up on the sidewalk. Spare change, spare change. And what do you do? Right in your face, what do you do? It's up to you. Do you look away? Do you find it disgusting? Do you despise the homeless people sitting at the BART station? And there's so many of them, and they smell. And you know, they're sleeping somewhere out in the elements, right? So, do you ignore them? Do you look away? It hurts. The pain of rejection hurts as much as the pain of hunger. How does Sunita deal with it? He lowers his heart, means he endured, he was patient, and he bowed every day. In this verse, we discover that Sunita was a cultivator. He had a practice of making prostrations, ritual prostrations. He bowed every day. That turned out to be the turning point for Sunita. Then I saw the great hero entering the city, the greatly awakened one with his monks in line, the most supreme of the Magadas, walking like a lotus, pure and refined. Sunita sees the great hero. Who's that? The Buddha. The Buddha's coming into town because it's alms rounds time. He's got all these monks lined up behind him. They're hoping that kind-hearted lay people will offer food to them. He's the awakened one. He's got his monks. He's from Magadha. He's the supreme of the Magadhans. And from Sunita's point of view, he says, look at this lotus. Look, they got a lotus on my desktop there. Here's a lotus. Notice the stem. The roots are down in the mud, but the lotus blossom is absolutely pure. He says that's how the Buddha enters the city, walking like a lotus, pure and refined. I lost all fear, set down my pole and baskets, I drew near and I wanted to bow, and then he, the conqueror of Mara, Stopped the line, he stood still, out of kindness, 
just for me. Amazing moment. What did Sunita do? He forgot, you know, being an outcast 101. ABCs of outcasts is you don't address anybody above you. You could be killed. You could be kicked to the curb. You could be wounded, stomped on for daring to approach. You're, even if your shadow touches the body of a Brahmin, they can never wash it clean, right? A broom swept in the hands of a Chandala, of a Harijan. If a upper caste person touches the broom, their hands are dirty forever. That's how society was built around the caste. Those are the taboos, right? What does Sunita do? He loses his, he's not afraid. He sets down his garbage man pole and baskets, goes over and offers, can he please bow to the Buddha? A kshatriya, not a Brahmin, but a kshatriya. That's dangerous for a Harijan. What did the Buddha do? Did he kick Sunita out of the way? Did he call his men to come and throw him out? He didn't. He stopped the line, put up a hand, said, go ahead. You want to bow? You go ahead. Right? What a moment. Right? I, I remember singing this the first couple times and just at this point when the, the image of the Buddha showing kindness to the untouchable, I, I got tears in my eyes because it was just so fine. The Buddha, by doing this, is breaking custom. He is committing a social taboo fearlessly, on purpose, right? After showing reverence at the feet of the teacher, I stood to one side and I said these words. O oh, great sage, supreme among all beings, may I take refuge and be home with you. So Sunita bows, he risks it, right? He does his number, he bows, that's what he does. He bows at the Buddha's feet and the Buddha oh, just receives it, receives his bow. Sunita is moved, he's risking it all, throwing the dice, he says, can I become your disciple? Could I become a monk? Big moment, right? What's the answer? The compassionate teacher raised a hand in a blessing with the sound of kindness for all the world. He said, come monk, that was my ordination. I crossed over and my new life began. The Buddha, on the spot, looked at his potentials, looked at his, used his wisdom to look at Sunita's opportunities and conditions and said, you're a monk. And they, there's a tradition that says at that time with the Buddha's blessings, when he accepted someone into the Sangha order, their hair fell out, their robe appeared in their body and they got the precepts because there were no precepts per se at that time. The monks hadn't violated the rules to create precepts, right? So Sunita has now become caste free. He's no longer simply an arhat. He's now a bhikshu, a bhikkhu in the Buddha's order. He's a Sangha member. Okay, what does he do with this opportunity? Oh my goodness. If this were a movie, the camera, we'd see a drone shot over the snowy mountains, and right, we're coming down to a cabin in the wilderness, and here's Sunita. Now I live alone, here in the mountains, here in Benogan. I never tire as I cultivate the way. Fear following my teacher's words, just as he taught me, with one mind by night and by day. So Sunita's yung gong ban dao, right? He is working hard at his cultivation, following the Buddha's instructions. He knows what it was like being homeless, hungry, despised, looked down on, spit upon, and he is taking advantage of his opportunity to cultivate. He is really made the Bodhi resolve. He knows where he's been and he knows where he wants to go. As the sun went down, I 
entered Samadhi I saw my past lives and I opened my Deva eye Just before dawn I broke through the mass of darkness to the state of the deathless I did certify so he gets success. He realizes success in his cultivation, inner samadhi. His psychic powers, his shantong, show up. Past lives power, the deva eye power shows up. And he, like the Buddha himself, like the prince, broke through the mass of darkness. This is a, a familiar way of describing enlightenment, right? Uh, what is it? Po he chi tong, right? The he chi tong, the black lacquer barrel breaks open. Ignorance is done and he realizes the deathless. He goes beyond samsara and reaches nirvana. Oh, the night was ending. The sun was returning. Indra and Brahma paid their respects to me. With their palms together, shining light the way gods do with eloquence they said these words to me look who shows up Indra and Brahma it's daylight the sun comes up again Sunita has been meditating all night got enlightened and the chief among gods we just heard about him they were there in the assembly of the Buddha they come down to welcome the brand new Arhat and they have their palms together these are the the boss in the heavens, right? And their bodies are shining light, and they say to Sunita, the former untouchable, homage to you, thoroughbred of humans. Homage to you, O oh, human supreme. Your afflictions have ended. All your suffering is over. You, dear sir, are worthy of offerings. They call him a thoroughbred of humans, a supreme human, someone who has gone beyond suffering, who is an arhat, worthy of offerings, right? Yin Gong in Chinese, he's an arhat. And they salute him. Okay, there is delicious irony here because the Buddha has overturned the entire social system that is the basis of Indian culture for all these years. And now he's taken an, a, an untouchable, an outcast, and taken him through the Dharma to the head of the class, right? To where the gods themselves say, you have done it, well done, human. We're in your, we, we, you, we are in awe of you. We admire you so much. We haven't done it yet. We're still devas. You're in our house. Okay. Upon seeing me, venerated by the devas, the teacher smiled and he proclaimed, through austerity, celibacy, restraint and self-control, one becomes a Brahman, he is a Brahman supreme. So, the last verse of Sunita's story is so, so much fun. So, the Buddha looks down, notices, oh, the devas are here, so, you know, saluting and praising my newest arhat. I'm going to add an editorial comment. Austerity, celibacy, restraint, and self-control. I might add parenthetically, this is probably the only folk song that has austerity and celibacy praised in it. One becomes a Brahman. He is a Brahman supreme. Not by birth, not by surname, not by caste, but by cultivation and realization. He's a Brahman supreme. So we put that together with our story of the audience around Bajra Treasury Bodhisattva, and we see, hmm, is this a fairy tale? Is this a legend? Is this a folklore? This is human lore. This is supreme wisdom 
technology from time without beginning. Luckily, because of our teacher, Master Shren Hua, he said, it's important you guys open this, these. Do look at these. Because the Buddha's voice, speaking English in the West, has information that will help you, as it has generations without counting. Okay. I want to ask the monks of the Berkeley Monastery to please let us know if there's any announcements for us. Uh, how did the, uh, let's see, Restore Sutra, Ulambana, Amitabha session, all of that. What's, what's the update? What's the latest? Well, we finished all our Dharma assemblies. So now we're back to our normal schedule where we do a morning ceremony, uh, meditation, a Dharma reflection, three steps, one bow. That goes to 8 a.m. And then we have afternoon, 12 p.m. to 1, Amitabha and Guan Yin recitation. Jing Forsher did today on Saturdays, 2 to 3.30, uh, uh, his Amitabha recitation. Uh, Jing Husher is doing his Medicine Master Buddha Sutras, 5 to 6 a.m. today. Great. And we have evening ceremony, 6.30 to 7.30. And we have the sutra lecture at night. So although we have just our normal schedule, it's a lot that people can plug into if they wish. Right. What's what's the weather like in the Bay Area today? Um, smoky. <laughs> Very smoky. Everybody is trying to get air purifiers because the uh, the air quality index says very unhealthy. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's like 150 particulate matter. I don't know how that translates to it's, but it's basically don't go outside it's really unhealthy it's a little bit better today than the last couple of days the two or three days ago that you go outside and like you mentioned it looked kind of apocalyptic it was red sky and like 10 a.m all the way to you know 5 6 p.m hmm. oh there's one more is tomorrow uh, in addition there's also the dharma practice q a from 1 p.m to 2 p.m people want to join we'll be talking about filiality uh, in a kind of a western context Okay, filiality. Oh, yeah, and there's no meditation tomorrow. Um, Jing Wei should just want to say that um, because we have a, a, a funeral service for a, a, his Polish friend. So people are welcome to join that if you wish. Um, you can maybe email um, email us at info at berkeleymonaster.org if you want the link. Um, they said that it's okay for people, to, other people to join. So, But that's a funeral service for a Polish friend. Okay. And that will uh, eliminate the daily yeah, meditation. Med yes, from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. tomorrow, in California time. All righty. Okay, so with that in mind, let's transfer the merit. We're going to transfer today with the Medicine Buddha Mantra to the melodious sounds of Australian magpies, just off microphone here. And... Uh, with the, we want everybody invite you to make a wish for where you would like the the gongda, the merit and the virtue, the punya, the goodness of attending the Avatamsaka Sutra lecture and joining in with your heart and head, and send it out to the world that needs it so much. This has been a very difficult time for so many people on so many levels. So let's. Uh, to be able to investigate the sutras means that we have touched something that doesn't change, right? It's called the Changju Fa, the, the eternally abiding Dharma. When we touch that, we know that fires come and go, water floods come and go, winds come and go, but the sutras remain. So, okay, we're going to chant. Please join. Sun, 
sage, ai sage, ai sage. Samud gate swaha. They say it's a good Broadway show when you walk out of the theater humming the tune, right? So carry that, it's a good mantra when you walk out of the Buddha hall or you leave Zoom chanting the mantra. Keep that mantra going. Good vibration. Okay, I'm gonna ring the bell and we can do three bows. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. See you all next week. Omitofo. Bye-bye.